All right. We have a uh, first ever interview. Uh, we've been doing our podcast show, video, whatever you want to call it, for yep. like about a year. Yep, a little over and a year. Jerry and I have been talking forever about wanting to get a, uh, do like an, 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 a bring in a guest kind of thing. Yep. And uh, we've held out for this guest because we wanted him to be the first. And uh, he's traveling all over the country, so it's hard to get him pinned down. But we got him yep. pinned down. Yep. We may have a little technical difficulties, but if we do, we're just going to roll through it. We will work through it. And Absolutely. we want to uh, take the opportunity to welcome... Scott to the show, Jerry. Mr. Scott Zane. Welcome to Grow My TSP, sir. There we go. There we go. Oh, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, awesome. Hey, man, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, can you just give us a little background about yourself and how you kind of got into TSP investing? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, as you guys uh, know, I'm a retired Air Force, Air Force Reserve. Uh, did four years active duty and then did uh, the last 16 years in the reserve, most all of it as an Air Reserve technician, which is dual status civilian and uh, reserve. Um, so the civilian side of it is how I got into the TSP. Uh, but after 20 years, I ended up retiring on the military side. And because it was a dual status position, I had to vacate my civilian position. And right. I thought about staying on uh, as a civilian with other, uh, other like maybe a DCMA or something. But I decided I wanted to take a different route. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of cool because now we got, we got an Army guy, a Navy guy, and an Air Force guy, you know, kicking around TSP ideas. It's kind of, a, it's kind of cool because obviously most of our, well, all of our, our peeps are government or military, and most of them kind of overlap both, you know, kind of like you are. So, um, you know, this, this would be a great interview for everybody. Um, so you got, you have two TSP-related Facebook groups, is that right? Can you just give us Correct. a little, like, the highlights of those two? Sure. Okay, so started out with the first group. I started it in 2014. Uh, that group was just used as a kind of a, a way to let my friends and coworkers from work know what I was doing with my account, how, when, why kind of stuff. Um, it was originally just text message stuff. And every day someone else uh, in the aircraft maintenance complex would come up and ask me, hey, I heard you got a text message thing uh, for TSP. Can, uh, can, I, can you add me to it? Yep. Not so easy to add someone to an existing text conversation. So, and all but one of them or two of them had a Facebook account. So I just decided, you know, why don't I just create a group? I can add you all to it. Just invite you all to it. You guys can join and, uh, you know, just let you guys know what I'm doing, when, how, why, whatever on there. Uh, it wasn't until later it started uh, to really explode with the growth. I think around, I think yours probably exploded too right around the same time when uh, tsp actually started their own facebook page right right uh, which is different from a group but what happened uh, you know people would search for tsp on facebook trying to find the tsp page and instead they would find either my group or yours and join it and it, the growth really exploded from there we actually limit it uh, now it, we're mostly about education and the main group. Uh, as you guys know, it's very heavily buy and hold, or as uh, Conan puts it, buy and hope. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we put a little post up there the other day in my group, and it kind of made its way to your group, and, and it caused a little bit of a kerfluffle, but uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, everyone's going to have their opinions, I guess. I uh, just... Yeah. I just kind of take it as a little bit of humor or whatever, some ribbing. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's mostly about educating people. And, you know, we get so many people there who don't have any clue what they're doing. And that was the whole purpose of the group. I had a lot of friends who had no idea what they were doing. I don't want to see them retire and not have uh, anything to show for in their account that should be able to have. And I came up with that. Uh, yeah. The Swing Traders group is my second group. Uh, I created that one only to try to keep my own swing trading activities and other swing trade related topics, uh, discussion out of the main group because I found what happened was uh, maybe I would announce a short-term move to G Fund, like 100% G Fund. Uh, 
Right. And it's only just to take advantage, even just like a two or three percent drop in price is all I cared about. Right. And I was, you know, but what I'd get was a lot of people who are new to investing, new to the group. They would see me moving to G and they'd get concerned. Oh, oh my, do I need to, should I move too? Because uh, all hell, all heck's going to break loose, whatever. Right. Uh, then I have to educate them. No, don't worry about this. I'm just playing my own short term game. Don't worry about it. The long term direction is up. And yeah. I would show the data on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, two two very different ways to play the game. I mean, we, we talk all the time about how there's all kinds of ways you can you can manage your TSP, right? Uh, at some point, hopefully, we'll get the seasonality guys on because um, those are probably the next guys that I would like to do, you know, uh, an interview like this with because a lot of people follow that that seasonality uh, group. And I mean, it, it's uh, Larry Williams on uh, on stock charts. He's, you know, one of the best uh, traders ever. And he bases his whole the basis of his of his philosophy really is is seasonality. And he applies technical analysis on top of that, and I'm sure fundamental analysis on top of that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so education is really where it's at. Um, but, yeah, th- so two, two completely different ways to, to look at it. Um, but your, yours primarily, I mean, I think your background primarily is fundamental analysis, right? It started out as pure, purely technical, like what you guys huh? do, but yeah. it, it ended up... Um, yeah, it actually evolved into fundamental. So how do you how do you use both of them then in terms of um, either in the groups or, or yourself in terms of TSP management? So first and foremost, as you know from our past discussions, uh, I focus mainly on S and P five hundred, um, the earnings data for all of the companies in the index. I have a spreadsheet I can actually show you guys, kind of more or less. Uh, kind of real quick. Uh, I know we're trying to keep the time on this down. Um, if you want, I can share my screen and show you guys what it looks like. Yeah, we can try it. Sure. Okay. Uh, can you guys see that? No. I was afraid that might be one of the technical glitches that we might run into if uh, if we tried to do that. I can't. I, I didn't set up any screen sharing for mine just because I, I didn't oh. wasn't sure I'd be able to do it. Oh, I, I think I figured it out. I forgot to hit the button. <laughs> so, um, okay. Okay, how about now? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so you should see a spreadsheet now. Uh, it has all 500 companies in the S&P 500 in here. It's actually 505 stock symbols because five of those companies have two share classes that are both in the index. Yep. Um, so this is just the raw data. So all of the companies here, yeah, I can tell you, uh, this column B, uh, what the name of the company is, and I can expand these. So I can tell you what sector, subsector, and yeah, all these different groups they're in. They break down from uh, basically larger groups into smaller groups. Um, also have price change data, market cap data. This is all automatically updated, by the way, by the server. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then right, right here from this part on over to right here is where I put the basic data in. Whatever the most recent date was they reported, I put there. When they're due next is uh, what I put there. And the quarterly earnings from the last five quarters. Mm-hmm. Uh, the five quarter ago in the black column, I only do that so I can compare. Like this one here, Chemco Realty, they really already they, they already uh, reported earnings, but I'm, they just haven't updated on the source that I uh, that right. I use. But so the last time they did report, you see like 26 cents per share is what they reported that quarter. Really, that's a a, a REIT company though, so it's uh, FFS. Um, but so they had a large loss there. But then yeah. if you look at AutoZone here, which I'll be updating this week. Um, they their last report was thirty five seventy two per share, and comparing that same quarter, they were up uh, over almost five dollars a share. Yeah, yeah. And they're projecting out uh, only one one percent. Uh, that's kind of the gist of how the raw data works. Yeah. Uh, once I have that in there, it's what can I get from that data? And right here is where I get that. So 
right now at everything combined is projecting upward by almost 12%. Yep. Uh, generally, whatever earnings is doing, you should expect the price to do the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, okay, here are my targets. So. Okay, so, yeah, that's kind of the uh, bread and butter, I guess I would call it, of uh, what exactly I do there. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's awesome. Because if you have a, uh, like you said, you started with a sort of a technical analysis kind of um, bias and then moved into fundamentals, which between the two of them, I mean, that's, you know, that that's kind of the, the best combination to to invest in general. Um, how do you how, what do you think about using that in terms of TSP, given the the two move, you know, the two IFTs a month and you have to have your trade in by noon and all that? Like, what do you think is the best way for people to sort of use all this, whether it's fundamental or technical, um, and be on the right side of the market, given the TSP restrictions? Uh, yeah, it's it's tricky because of that. But I mean, especially if you're going to swing in and out between stocks and bonds, because uh, as you know, everyone, you know, what you guys know, I mean, some of your viewers don't know, the first two IFTs you do in each calendar month that can do anything you want to do. But yeah. once you've done that, the third and subsequent, uh, you can only go in the direction of G. It doesn't have to all be at one time. But right. once right. You're, you're locked in, once you get to 100% G fund or until the new month starts. Right, right. Um, I Yeah. Uh, it does. It makes it, it makes it tricky. I mean, if you're, if you're trading in, in an IRA or a brokerage account, uh, I'm sure you, you trade much differently than you do in your TSP side, right? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the moving average lines and, and some of the indicators in a much different way when I trade my IRA than I do you know, when I trade my TSP because I don't have those restrictions. Uh, yeah, it'd be way different. On my uh, my brokerage account, uh, I actually prefer futures contracts. Uh, very, very volatile. I, I, so I can handle strong, uh, huge ups and downs in my account balance. But uh, yeah, TSP, it's, it's real tricky because you only get that one price per day and uh, limits on what you can do. Uh, so personally, when if it comes through, because I know there's been talk about, I think it's next summer, mm -hmm. adding in five thousand mutual fund options. Yeah, they're talking about I'm opening. I'm seriously looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yep, yeah, mutual fund window. So, um, Is it, good. Yeah, so I was going to say on that same spreadsheet, I actually have another worksheet on there that tells me sector by sector. Uh, which sectors are expecting the strongest earnings growth and which ones are expecting the weakest. So if I know that when, uh, if TSP actually does implement that change, you now where we can maybe invest in sector ETFs or MFs yeah. or whatever, mutual funds, for those of you guys who don't know what MFs are, um, I can focus my attention specifically on those sectors or industries that I'm expecting to have the strongest growth and just sit there and hopefully watch it outperform the, the stock index funds. Yeah, we've talked about that on, on shows that we've done in the past. And uh, there are 11 sectors in the S&P. And if you could, uh, for, well, from my perspective, I would just chart them. I mean, from your perspective, you're looking at the earnings uh, and which earnings have have more growth per sector going forward versus the overall S&P, right? For me, I'm just looking at it on the chart and uh, I'm com I, I do a relative strength chart of each individual sector versus the S&P as a whole. And I want to be in the sectors that are outperforming the S&P, right? So th there's, a, there's a couple of things there that are kind of interesting. Like I think the, the stuff that I've read is, yeah, the mutual fund window might offer 5,000 mutual funds, right? I'm not looking at 5,000 mutual funds. I'm looking at the, the ETFs that represent the 11 sectors of the S&P 500 uh, so I can have some kind of uh, usable universe. I can't use 5,000 choices, right? Yeah, correct. So, if you, yeah, if you know which, where, which areas of narrow you're focused on, uh, yeah, same, same concept as me. It's just uh, now with the fundamental part, uh, a lot of the professionals who do fundamental, they still use technicals. It's more like the fundamentals tell them what.
to be interested in first. Right. And then once they know what they're interested in, they'll use the technical data to figure out when to jump in or when to jump out. Right. Right. Yeah. To, to be honest, I, I need to, to get much smarter on the technicals because you're right. Th- those are the, are the fundamentals because the fundamentals are the, are the things that show you what to look at and the technicals tell you when to buy it or when to sell it. Um, and so for TSP, you know, yeah. since we only have the five funds right now, um, from my perspective, I just, I just do the technicals. Um, but once the mutual fund window opens, it changes, it definitely changes things for the, for the way better for us. The only, the only question I have about that is, are the two move per month rule going to stay? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I, there, there are so many things and, and over the past you know month or so, when, when word started getting out about this thing that's supposed to kick off in the summer, um, I started thinking about some other things. I mean, how cool would it be if you could put a stop loss in or, or a buy limit in TSP, you know? Uh, that'd be interesting. I mean, I don't personally use stop losses or things like that, even on my future stuff, but uh, I know yeah. a lot of people do. And you have more courage you know, more than me, brother. <laughs> does give people who... <laughs> oh, yeah. I have no idea how much that account of mine goes. that could go in any direction pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me see what else I got. All right. I think, uh, I think we covered a lot of good stuff. Um, let me ask you one last question. So our, our investment philosophy at, at Grow My TSP is basically to be uh, in the stock funds when the market's moving up and protecting the gains uh, obviously using the G fund primarily, sometimes the F fund, but the idea is to be in the stock funds when the market's moving up and, and protecting those gains when the market's moving down. So if, if you could whittle down your sort of uh, philosophy of investing in TSP, what, what would it be? Um, I guess uh, adapt to whatever the situation is, whatever the conditions are. Uh, because sometimes uh, I, I really want to be playing uh, just a, a short term, jump in and out, take any couple of percent gains I can get, uh, let the price drop back down a little bit, just get a little bit more shares back on the next buy in. But uh, I find that in certain conditions, uh, like going back to the fundamentals, if I see double digit earnings growth expected, I don't expect to perform well with the short term game. So yep. I'll play a more of a long term game and just if I can try to just jump back and forth between S and C fund only and just whatever one's outperforming the other. Yeah. Hopefully I'm in that one and then I'll, I'll jump out and wait for the other one to overtake the, the one I just jumped out of. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So many ways to play the game. It's, it's uh it's really cool actually. Um, all right, Scott, I think uh, we've, we've been on for a minute, right? Yeah. It's not been that long, you know, yeah. you guys are about 20 minutes, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you, do you have any? Do you have? Have you have any uh, last thoughts? Uh, you did have a question on the on the pre production stuff about what technical analysis I use because yeah, I know everybody does have their interest in that, and uh, yeah, we all tend to have different things we look at even on that level. Yep. Um, so I do want to point out a couple things here. Uh, so one is I like to look at pivot points. And I can show you some data on that. Uh, another one that I actually recently discovered through technical analysis is correlation between the bond yield curve, uh, what direction it's moving, and whether C fund or S fund seems to outperform. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you have it, yes, share the screen. I really Let's can't take a look. Get good earnings that. Sorry, you glitched really badly. Oh, no problem. Can you hear me now? I can hear you a little. Uh, you're glitching, but I can understand you. Okay. Did you want to share a screen about about pivot points or the yield curve? I'm um, sure. Yeah, I have both, and I did that this on my weekly. I'm gonna go ahead and. Uh, where is it? And I'll find it first. Um, nope, not that one. I think it's that one. Yeah. All right. Okay, so pivot points basically is where the price kind of yeah always 
uh, sits around a certain price level. Yep. Uh, I use this right here. I made this yellow rectangle to show you where the, the price was, uh, what range it was in the entire time that, you know, that six day period. And I also put this on the spreadsheet so I can really show this. And that's what I have right here. I just if it hit a certain price that day, I put a one there. If it did not, I just don't put anything there. And over here on the right side, it counts them all up. And wherever the most instances are is where the where it congregates around. So the 4588, this is uh, S&P futures, by the way, not S&P 500. It's okay. they're generally really close in price, but um, they're, they're sometimes you have what uh, uh, what's called backwardation or a contango, uh, where the price can be a little bit different on the futures side. Yep. But yeah, so 4588 to 4593 is where it really wanted to congregate the most at the bottom of the, or, you know, the, this recent dip right before it jumped up. Yep. And it had a large, a lot of instances between the 4607 and I think it was actually, it might have been a little bit lower, but 4577 up to 4607. Would you see so, that if you did it on a volume? Uh, a lot if, of times. If you did that on a volume chart, would you see it? In, in, a, in a different way, but would it be similar? I uh, don't know. On that one right here is where it's all at. Yeah, yeah, there is ex increased volume, but that's uh, that's an anecdote, I would call it, where it's, it's kind of the case in this particular situation, but it won't necessarily be the case all the time. Okay. Uh, and then also... Um, okay, so here's the bond yield curve, the 10-year minus the two-year. And what I noticed is when it's steepening, you know, using this, uh, the little white dots here are what the actual difference is. And then these are the 10, 50, 100, and 200-day moving averages of whatever that difference is. Um, as it gets steeper like that, I yep. find that uh, I've at least anecdotally again, because I didn't back test very far, uh, but... S fund strongly outperformed C fund while this was going up. But right. then once it topped down and started turning back downward, I noticed that C fund was the better performer. Mm -hmm. That is, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I only look at yield curves in terms of the F fund. Um, I hadn't thought about comparing them to the C and the S fund. That's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, now F fund, uh, it's, that's the, the best time to be in that is actually when bond yields are high and it's, you're expecting them to drop because bond yep. prices and bond yields generally move in the opposite direction. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, 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 if I'm not in the stock funds, I'm generally in the G fund unless the F fund chart um, can, can sort of overcome the value of uh, the security of the G fund, because you know the F fund's not volatile enough to, to make any money in really, um, and so for me I'd rather be in the G than the F unless the F is in some kind of a breakout, which a breakout in the F is kind of kind of bad for the economy in general. But um, yeah, so so many ways to look at the at the data and uh, and kind of use the indicators that that resonate with you. Uh, okay, you glitched, but I heard something about what indicators re resonate that resonate with me. Are you talking about fundamental or technical? Well, I mean, whichever. Like, like you, you, I'm sure look at a bunch of different indicators, but you have a, probably a, a list of a handful that that you really follow, right? Because they kind of speak to you. Uh, yeah. So fundamentally. Uh, the ones I look at extremely often and very closely are the monthly ISM, uh, Manufacturing Services Reports. I actually have them on a spreadsheet there, too, I can show you. Uh, let me pull those up for you. Okay, so I pull them off the ISM website, and then I kind of translate them into something that's a little bit more plus minus. Uh, if you look at the actual report, they'll come out as we're... Uh, 50, uh, reading a 50 means that half of the companies are reporting growth, half of them are reporting contraction or expansion and contraction, whatever. So okay. what I do is I, uh, yeah, I just put all the numbers in here, but basically uh, 
tell you what how far they deviate from 50 in either direction and, and of course you see the color codes there to kind of give you an idea uh, where things are at so back here when covid was uh well actually that's not just covid that was more stuff going on. this is really weak data here ultimately it's very mild growth here even a little bit negative here overall as you see here for like a five month span yep. um, so these are the kind of conditions i would expect when i'm yeah there might be a a more a valid concern possibly about uh, e economic uh, recession uh, this kind of stuff here when i see a lot of dark green uh, no this is like the last place you'd see a recession come into play yeah um it's it's extremely positive right now we have this uh, supply issue here going on though so that is a problem there um, services side too um, which is actually what the U.S. economy is more largely based now. Uh, you see, it's very green. Yeah. Uh, still inventory issues, but all 18, uh, all 18 of the industries in the services sector uh, are reporting growth. And was, these were just these reports just came out this last week. So this that's actually a great transition. And and I forgot to ask you the uh, that last question that I have was what. Uh, given all that, and like I said, a, a good transition, how are we looking going into 2022? Uh, I think you asked how's it looking going into 2022. Um, so that I'm actually, uh, like, I, like I was pointing out earlier on my spreadsheet, I'm, I'm projecting about 12% earnings growth from the S&P 500. Um, usually C and S fund have really strong correlation from uh past research, uh, you know, just looking for correlations, I found that it's about 85% or so daily correlation, which means whatever direction C fund goes, S fund goes the same direction 85% of the time. So if you at least know what to expect from the S&P 500, which is the very widely tracked index, and it's the economic bellwether, it's also the one that the C fund follows, then you can kind of reason in the same general direction whether it outperforms or underperforms is another question though yep yep yeah awesome 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 all right man anything else you can think of uh no i think that's uh that kind of covers uh the basics of uh what i i mean there's more i go really into detail oh, but yeah. uh, we, gotta, yeah. we don't want your video to be uh your podcast to be too long no, no, I, I, um, I know we've, we've talked in the past a couple few times and, and, uh, your come from is great. I, I learn a lot every time I talk with you because I, I don't have that same kind of come from that you do. You know, my, my whole day is spent looking at charts and, uh, I, I need to get better at looking at the data that you're looking at. Can you hear me? Yeah, there was a lot of glitch there. Okay. No, no problem. No I, I problem. All right. Oh, actually, you know what? I, I noticed the audio seems a little bit better when we're on the split screen. We're, we're good now. You can hear me now, right? Okay. All right, well, thanks for having me on. Uh, uh, we'll see you guys uh, around and uh, look forward to watching later. Yeah, yeah. And have, have a great Christmas and uh, best of luck in 22. We'll do it. You guys do the same. Take care. Uh, thanks. All right, are we All back? Right. I think we're back. Well, a uh, couple little technical glitches. You know, we got to yeah. get the audio thing worked out. Uh, Scott was a was a big team player there. Yeah, he was. Yeah, uh, he, he helped he, us out. His sure. his side wasn't. He wasn't able to hear us as well. Yeah. But uh, now it was awesome having him on. I mean, yeah. I, I've I've talked with him quite a bit. Yeah, I know you guys talk a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm hopefully we can get him back on the show again. If yeah. if if you're still listening, Scott, uh, I don't know if he's gone or not, but yeah. um, uh, we'd like to make this a, you know a semi regular thing. If he's in the area, man, it'd be great to get him in person. Oh yeah, yeah. You That'd guys would just geek out. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to go get coffee. Come back a little later. Yeah, yeah. But uh, hopefully, you guys got some value out of this. Uh, what we're trying to do is show, you know, some different ways to kind of. Uh, look at the same thing, right? Yeah. A lot of people think that we're kind of just setting our methodology. It's really not the case. It's just m more often than not, it's just w you know what you know. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And so bringing people in, whether it's, um, you know, folks like Scott who look at the TSP, we're, we're, we're hoping to bring in some people that maybe 
don't look at the TSP, but could give us a, you know, some different angles uh, in a bigger picture, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. This All is, right, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to, once we get this uh, technical things worked <laughs> out, right, uh, bringing people onto the show I think is going to be a, um, a real value add. It is. It is. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to check out our show. Make sure to go uh, visit Scott's Facebook groups. Uh, we'll do our best to put those in the links or something uh, yep. since we don't have them handy here in the video. You guys take it easy, and we are out of here. here.